Καραμπάχ should stop being an excuse for the dictator's υποφαλίευ, for the economic isolation of Armenia and security dependence on Russia. It should stop, it should stop being instrumentalized by everybody at the expense of the people that live there. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends of Faces of Armenia, we warmly welcome you to another special series on Arza. Our distinguished guest today, Professor Theokardis Grigoriadis, is not only an expert on the post-Soviet neighborhood, but also teaches at the Freie Universität Berlin. A quick note to the format because, before we begin. Faces of Armenia's special series on Artsakh offers experts from a broad spectrum of disciplines a platform to share their perspectives and reflect upon Nagorno-Karabakh. By elevating their perspective, we hope to strengthen mediating forces, add to the substance of ongoing discussions of which both will hopefully contribute to a timely end of the war. We faces of Armenia see ourselves as a bridge between Armenia and the connect, um, international community calling for productive relationships and engaging um, narratives. Today's format um, is special. In today's interview, we are joined by Ricardo Bergmann, the newest addition to Faces of Armenia's team, who is working on expanding our network into Germany. But without further ado, Professor Theokaris, can you please um, give us a little bit more to your person, to yourself, to your personality? Thank you very much, Mr. Koenig, for this very kind uh, invitation. Thank you very much. Uh, my former student, uh, Mr. Bergman, also for this idea to join tonight uh, your wonderful initiative on Faces of Armenia on connecting South Caucasus to Europe and the European Union. So um, I am professor for economics and East European studies at the Institute for East European Studies of Freie Universität Berlin. I have been working here in Berlin since 2012 uh, in this capacity. And I have been very active uh, in the post-Soviet region, as you have suggested, but also in the Eastern Mediterranean region. And I'm very much interested, uh, being originally from Greece, um, in, in developments that touch both uh, the Black Sea, the Caucasus, but also the East Mediterranean. And in that sense, um, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, the region itself is of major importance to me and my research. Um, I have uh, also been managing a, a series of grants that send Berlin students to the Caucasus. Ricardo has been one of them uh, to study the languages, the culture, the economy and the political system of, this, of the region. Yeah, and as far as my background is concerned, I come to Berlin uh, through a major world, tri world trip of my studies. I started my studies uh, in Athens, in law. Then I continued with political science and languages at Yale in the US. Then uh, international economic relations in Moscow and St. Petersburg. And then political and comparative economics at Berkeley in San Francisco. And after San Francisco, I landed in Berlin. Then a short stay in Mannheim, where I worked as a researcher. And then back to Berlin as an assistant professor and now an associate professor. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Professor Theoharis, for your introduction. And um, let's just go directly into, into the topic. Um, what is your assessment um, of the origins of the war that we see right now? So um, the conflict is already ongoing for several decades. And um, you have been in this region several times. You have been uh, to Russia. So You, you know a lot about this region. What is your assessment? What is your impression from the um, happenings right now and, and the origins? 
Exactly. So it is very important to keep in mind that the current conflict uh, relates to the border situation and the fate of Armenian nationalism in the aftermath of the Armenian genocide in 1915. Uh, both Armenia, but also Greece and other countries were favored by the victory of the Allies and the Wilson plan for the dismantling of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, as a reward to those nations that supported the Allied forces against the Ottoman Empire and the Central Powers. But of course, the genocide and also the subsequent um, uh, reorganization of Turkish nationalism and the, and the uh, rapprochement between Republican Turkey and so the new Soviet Russia created new conditions and new developments for Armenian nationalism, but also for Azerbaijan nationalism, which was always very tightly connected and territorially Armenia, and at the same time recognized the economic significance of Azerbaijan in the South Caucasus region. So the origins of the Karabakh conflict reflect first and foremost the decision of the new Soviet Union, the first state that actually recognized Republican Turkey, and it's, it's very interesting to see that this very close relationship of the two historical enemies of the Black Sea, Russia and Turkey, has been quite um, close, quite significant, significantly good, only in very rare time windows in history. And we're experiencing right now this window, and we experience this window of, of uh, rapprochement, of convergence of foreign policy interests also in the beginning of the 1920s. The, the, the time when the status of Nagorno-Karabakh, of Berg-Karabakh in German, of mountainous Karabakh, or of High Karabakh in French, we observe so many different uh, definitions, or of Artsakh, as the political name of the region now is, was decided at the moment of when Armenian policy, Armenian foreign policy, and the Armenian statehood, statehood itself was at stake. It was at, at, the, at the historical low. And I think that this feeling of injustice about what the borders of Armenia should be and whether the economic significance of the, of the, of, uh, and the comparative economic significance of the three South Caucasus states should be taken into account for the allocation of territories exactly lies in the center of this conflict. So Karabakh, 94% at the time of its declaration as an autonomous oblast, 1923 was 90, uh, was 94% as I said Armenian, but at the same time one must think that um, one must also think that Armenians were wide, were spread all over the Caucasus. So they were not just in Karabakh and Armenia proper, as we read. They were of course very active in Baku. They were active in the oil business of Baku. They were running the Tbilisi municipality in Georgia until also until the 20s. So we're talking about the regional and local Armenian cosmopolitanism that was, of course, uh, undermined and hit very aggressively as a result of these uh, territorial divisions among the three countries of the Caucasus. I mean, Georgia is not as relevant, although it's also quite important, particularly what is really what, what matters is the relationship with Azerbaijan. And the fact that both Karabakh was decided I mean, to be given to Azerbaijan and also the zone of Nahitsevan in the west of Armenia. This was an insistence of Kemal Ataturk of Republican Turkey that wanted for its own strategic regions to have Azerbaijan as a neighboring country of its own, but also, um, um, which also would facilitate Turkey's relationship to Iran. This is essentially the historical background where like all borders of modern nation states, they were defined by randomness, by the given constellation of interests at the time that these borders were decided. As I said, this was a historical moment, very negative for Armenian national interest and for Armenian statehood that was trying on the one hand to prevent the uh, unique uh, um, loss of human capital, France to the United States as a result of the genocide from the territories that Armenians call Western Armenia and on the other hand, to create this Eastern or Soviet Armenian state within uh, the Soviet Union and having Russia, of course, as a guarantor, as a safeguard for Armenian security and existence. 
So, Professor Teokaris, you brought up a very interesting observation when you discussed um, Armenian and Azeri nationalism. Can you reflect a little bit how these concepts play and unfold into this uh, war and into this conflict? So essentially we have, um, so um, Armenians were quite present in Baku's economic and social life uh, of, uh, until World War I and until the creation of those borders. Essentially a major component of uh, Karabakh Armenians are not only locals, but also refugees, Armenian refugees from Baku. And Karabakh has always been a place that has been receiving uh, but also sending out refugees. I did field work in Northern Caucasus, in Krasnodar, in Russia, and in Sochi, and there you will see many refugees of Karabakh, Armenian refugees from Karabakh from the 1990s war. So Karabakh has been essentially the new symbol of Armenian, um, of Armenian, uh, of, of, of Armenian flights, one could say, of, of the so-called security problems that the Armenian population is facing outside the borders of Armenia. So if I may add another quick follow-up, how do you see the genocide, the experience of the genocide relate to the question of Artsakh in the eyes of Armenians? For many Armenians, or if not for all Armenians, <clears throat> what is happening right now in Artsakh and the existence of Artsakh itself is directly connected to the genocide. I visited Yerevan myself 15 years ago, and I had the opportunity to see with my own eyes the connection. So in the memorial of the genocide, we have um, a, a burial uh, location. So we have graves of soldiers that fell in the first wars, in the first post-Soviet wars of Karabakh. So the connection, the, 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 um, uh, one would say the, this image of, of the Turkic or Turkish nations that want to essentially annihilate or attack Armenian, the Armenian soul, the Armenian identity is something very present and very central. And it, it, it connects the Karabakh wars of independence and the genocide connect one century of Armenian identity. I would say that this has been quite counterproductive for Armenian development, but it has been quite important for Armenian politics. Yeah. And um, some of our um, audience would wonder, Azerbaijani and Armenians were living for a long time together in, during the Soviet Union. And um, they might wonder why there is, after or in the end of the Soviet Union, such a, such a break up, such a, um, yeah, image of enemy where you before that have been brothers or tavares, tavarisi. Um, can you maybe um, evaluate on this? The socially effective in, in uh, alleviating all these differences. We saw it in a much more, and this was a problem of socialism in general. We saw it in the case of Serbs and Croats in former Yugoslavia with, with that the breakup of Yugoslavia ended up in massive slaughter. Of course, Stalin's Soviet Union was much more efficient in that uh, than Tito's Yugoslavia, particularly because Stalin uh, was mu a much, much more efficient in manipulating inter-ethnic differences in order to maintain Soviet authority. Tito apparently was not so effective in that because he had done this division that Croats control the economy and serves the army. So we have this difference between these two big socialist federations, the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia. In the case of the Soviet Union, as I said, what we observe in the Caucasus is the absolute political and economic predominance of Georgia. So Azerbaijan and Armenia were always coming second and third, and rather Armenia was coming third because it had given its territorial and uh, economic significance was falling behind Azerbaijan that was able essentially to, um, to use uh, its uh, contribution and uh, to, to both to the Republic, to, to, to its own, but also to the contribution of the, of the oil sector, of the oil sector, both to, the, to its own budget, but also to the Soviet budget. Uh, so Azerbaijan was able essentially to use his, its energy advantage for its own benefit in, within, uh, so, within the Soviet political system. 
At the same time, this concept of brotherhood, yes, the Soviet society was very liberal, was very open in several aspects um, and very open-minded also in terms of, uh, in, so, inter so inter-ethnic racism or differences were much smaller in the Soviet Union compared to other parts of the so-called capitalist world, but at the same and uh, at the same time, it is important to keep in mind that um, uh, that Armenia and Azerbaijan and this whole um, idea of, um, of, of, of borders and territory um, were never reconciled between the two, I would say. And when the moment of independence came with the breakup of the Soviet state, when Moscow was not anymore so able to control and play divide and rule like it has always done, between the different uh, Soviet socialist republics, then the whole system, then the whole system got a very negative direction. Now I think we have a sort of very good foundation to understand the uh, historical conflict, the context of the conflict. And we would now like to take an international lens, a lens of various interests. So can you describe the evolution of Russian interests, or so to speak, of Soviet interests in Armenia, in Nagorno-Karabakh, in Azerbaijan? On the one hand, uh, Soviet Russia favored Azerbaijan in the distribution of territories. So the fact that there is a territory of Azerbaijan west of Armenia and Karabakh was not part of Armenia, and that the borders of Armenia were decided six years after the genocide in the Treaty of Moscow, plus the fact that Azerbaijan is much bigger than Armenia, even without Karabakh itself, and much richer. So the fact that Armenia is a landlocked country with no access to the Turkish hinterland that, was used, that used to be inhabited by Armenians for several thousand years, so all this constellation that actually Armenians themselves also contributed to, in, in my opinion, or did not uh, protest against it sufficiently, or the elites did not protest against it sufficiently. The problem of Armenian elites, in my opinion, is a major issue that one needs to consider. And this has to do with this dichotomy between the elites and the intellectuals of the Ottoman Empire that left for Paris and New York, and the people that stayed behind. Yes, I mean, it's obvious that this territorial question really connects to, um, um, to the way that the Armenian government has been able to develop itself. How then would you, um, or what is your explanation for that Azerbaijan, shortly uh, already after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, came together with Turkey? And also in the recent years, like we can see, okay, Armenia joined the Eurasian Economic Union, Azerbaijan did not. Um, how would you explain that when you say, okay, Russia basically favored, or the Soviet Union favored Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan had maybe more good relations to Moscow um, at some point, but why then it did not join um, the Eurasian Economic Union? Why it has such a strong relation then to Turkey? Exactly, so the deal, the equilibrium that I just described to you, that Armenia is getting aid from Russia for its external relations and external defense, and Azerbaijan gets priority within the domestic or the regional economic constellation, does not hold anymore. Uh, so essentially one observes that Russia has really moved from this equilibrium, has really moved uh, from uh, the equilibrium that actually um, uh, places Armenia as a priority for Russian foreign policy in the Caucasus, also against or towards Turkey. So Russia has clearly moved away from this, which has been essentially a very important principle of both uh, the Soviet and the early post-Soviet Russia. So what do we observe right now? I mean, one, I mean, you know that the early transition for all of these countries was a very a period of very strong identity formation. So you see in Ukraine, for example, identity is still an inconclusive issue. Ukrainian identity is still being formed the time we're speaking. Why? Obviously because, as I, I, al I always like to say, Ukraine is both Gogol and Shevchenko. It's both Ukraine within the Russian imperial context and it's also Ukraine as a national narrative. So uh, 
I mean, in, in the Caucasus, we do not have this complexity of identity as we have in Ukraine, in the European Slavic lands uh, of the former Soviet Union. It was, Azerbaijan, it was a very Western economy at the time of the transition in the 90s. It's not anymore, but it used to be. So it was the natural outlet of Azerbaijan to the West. And of course, also, in the end of the 80s, Turgut Ozal and several other Turkish intellectuals cultivated this pan-Turanic or pan-Turkic movement that would involve the Muslim nations of the Caucasus and Central Asia, which actually involved lots of Turkish support against the Chechen separatist movement, which was then responded by the Russians with the support of the Kurdish movement through Armenia. It is quite, um, it is quite imp- so we understand that for Azerbaijan, Turkey, was an outlet to the West and also the closest culturally uh, outside the Soviet context. So then how do you explain or how do you see the role of Russian peacekeeping missions of Russian military bases in Armenia in the context really of the Turkish pan, um, pan Turkish movement and the a close connection between Azerbaijan and Turkey. So I don't think this um, this measure is in the interests of Armenia. I think that uh, it's only a Russian peacekeeping force in quotes. In reality, it will be a Russian occupation force that will be also formally in the field in the same way it is in Abkhazia or South Ossetia. And then and please, 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 I'm sorry to interject here. Can you help our audience clearly understand the difference between a peacekeeping force and an occupation force? <laughs> yeah, I mean, a peacekeeping force makes sure that there is no fighting. So essentially, a peacekeeping force protects the civilians. A peacekeeping force is contributing to the normalization of everyday life, is helping aid workers to distribute food uh, and other resources is helping construction to rebuild destroyed buildings. So it prevents the conflict from being uh, started again. An occupation force is uh, something different. It comes with a political agenda and it has essentially a goal to converge or to bring a territory under the sphere of influence of a particular state and preserve essentially the quasi-state character of this particular territory forever. This is the difference. Whereas a peacekeeping force is not... So extending your argument, essentially Russia's interest is to create regional instability yeah. to sell overpriced security? Yeah, of course. And now even more. And uh, would you say that um, somehow the Armenian government, current government, maybe underestimated the current situation? Or like, would you say, okay, that, that would have been visible? Of course, we would, we now see what's happening. And so we are, we, we know what, what happened. Um, and, um, but yeah, what's your assessment um, concerning the change of the government in 2018? Yeah, I, the Aliyev regime is one of the most problematic regimes, and the word problematic is really very light expression here in the post-Soviet region. I have met several people, several other students that are refugees from Jebrail, which is not related to Armenia. It does not have Armenians. And despite that, it was occupied by the Armenian army and it's also beyond the borders of Karabakh. So, so we must mention also this, Uh, it, of course, I don't do this to um, equal, equalize losses and suffering or to underestimate the, the, the historical connection of Karabakh to the Armenian nation. But at the same time, I think it's important to say that there are also refugees from the other side that have suffered as a result of this continuous war. You brought up an invaluable point. You mentioned that you have some Azeri students. So what is their popular perception? Do you think there is any common ground? Do they have empathy for the lives lost during the genocide? Do they have empathy no. for the war that is going no. on? 
There is no empathy, unfortunately. Now it's still war and everybody has friends, family that are fighting and they care just about them. They don't have the time to care about uh, their historical responsibilities or, the, or about the historical suffering of the enemy, because that's how they see the Armenians as the enemy. So, and uh, it's really quite important to keep in mind that this is happening. But at the same time, having said that, I think it's very important to really see that as long as Armenia was, sli was slightly much, was a slightly more open regime, political regime than Azerbaijan, the situation was working for Armenia. Now that Armenia decided some years ago to make a, a, a larger step towards the West, you have the realignment of Russia with Azerbaijan. So, and this is quite interesting, an interesting development. The point is how credible this is going to be from the Russian side in the sense that how much Russia is going to insist or how much Russia is going to exercise pressure on the Armenian prime minister and his government to change course. Before we have a look more on individual stakeholders in this conflict, I think um, before we move on, it would be quite important to understand really other key players in this conflict in the region, say Iran, for example, Turkey, because one really wonders, um, even though the border between Armenia and Turkey is close, in the recent years, especially before the conflict, um, hundreds of millions of goods between the two countries were exchanged via Georgia. So the common consensus, I believe, was an approachment between Turkey and uh, Armenia, especially before Erdogan's more repressive policies. Exactly. So, so how did this um, uh, fate twist? I think that uh, the, the, the protocols uh, that were signed in Switzerland with the presence of Sergei Lavrov and Hillary Clinton and the two ministers, foreign minister of Turkey and the foreign minister of Armenia some years, Armenia needs to re to um, reestablish economic relations with Turkey. In the end of the day, this was, Eastern Turkey was the Armen Armenia's historical territory and hinterland and uh, connections, trade routes don't die because nations moved uh, in terms of population and territory to the East or the West. The connections are always staying. I mean, in economic history and political economy, we study very actively this uh, whole literature on legacies, on the way that economic legacies facilitate contemporary political and economic outcomes and imperial legacies for that matter. The, connect, the, the relationship of Armenia with Turkey is important, but unfortunately not this Turkey. This Turkey does not really, is not really interested in, in peace, stability, development and security. It imposes a quite aggressive militaristic profile in the region because this shows that Turkey is not really ready to come in terms with its past and the way it treated its Christian citizens 100 years ago. So I think that this is quite important. And with this president, I don't think, unfortunately, because Turkey is a very important country for our region, it has the best part of the Mediterranean under within its borders, one can say, it connects Middle East with Caucasus, Aegean, Balkans, everything. Concerning Turkey, actually, Turkey is um, still <laughs> a member of the NATO. What do you think? How will the other NATO members um, see the, the current development? I think that Turkey has done everything possible to invalidate NATO. First, with... Uh, <laughs> First, with the, the obvious acquisition of Russian equipment, it's time to talk about European security because with the US treating NATO the way it does by basically not doing anything, and Turkey canceling de facto NATO uh, commitments, I think the European countries must find another way of serving Europe's interests because it cannot move forward like this. I mean, um, it's, um, uh, NATO must not be subject to Turkey's decision to start a conflict in Karabakh or in the Aegean or in Cyprus or in North Syria or in Northern Iraq. 
this makes NATO's reputation irrelevant. I mean, thank you very much for giving a great segue into getting Europe into the analysis. And I think here, Europe like has core, two core interests which are relevant to this conflict, energy security and terrorism. So what was Europe's, what is the evolution of Europe's stance towards this conflict, towards key players into this conflict and what can Europe do? So I think that France is really the country we should be focusing on, and Fra with ba with ba based on France, I think we can we can think about developing a European strategy uh, towards this conflict. So yeah, I think we we, we mu Europe must really decide to commit resources for a European army that will be headquartered in France and uh, we'll be able to uh, selectively intervene. But when we just um, have in mind like the, um, or when we just have a look from the economic perspective, then I think the European, the choice of the European Union would be clear to just cooperate further with Turkey, because Turkey is a much bigger market, is like the uh, trade turnover between, between Turkey and the European Union is, is much more higher than, um, probably with the, the whole Caucasus. Um, that's, that's true. But of course, yeah. there is not only economic conditionality, it's also political conditionality. Mm -hmm. This is exactly essentially the logic of Russia. So if the difference between Europe and Russia is that Europe really operates on the basis of values as well, not just on the basis of economic interests, not because it wants to lose money or resources, but because values really create a much more con consistent and long run um, flow of friends and, ben and economic benefits to the European Union itself. Yes, Turkey now is much more important, but at the same time, uh, Europe may not want to be connected to the policies of Erdogan in the Middle East. Europe may not want to feed into the blackmail of Erdogan with the refugees. So there are, it's, it's, it's not a univariate equation, it's multivariate. So there you bring up a wonderful point talking about values. Could you compare and contrast how Armenian values align or at least assimilate European values? So the Armenians, uh, I mean, if you go from Beirut to Jerusalem, to Paris, to San Francisco, you see Armenians. So Armenians, are only second to Jews in terms of cosmopolitan, extrovert uh, activity, education. Um, so all these elements that we use to describe those people, those um, uh, people that were uh, analyzed as Mercurian by Yuri Slyoskin in his book about the Soviet Union. So Armenians, like the Jews, are also Mercurian people. And they are people that have contributed to the welfare and the intellectual development of any country they were located in. Let this be the Russian Empire, France, the United States, or Palestine or Syria. So I think that uh, it is quite important. Um, uh, it is quite important. So, we, we, so essentially, and they were, so it's quite important to keep that in mind. So if we're talking about a, 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 demo, a democratic, tolerant, extrovert, European Union, we're talking about a European Union that has a lot of those elements that made Armenians survive and distinguish themselves all over the globe. So I think it's, it's quite obvious, this, this inherent cosmopolitanism that characterizes the Armenian, that has characterized historically the Armenians the last 200 years, is something that Europe has and must further develop. Just uh, one more question concerning the European Union from my side. Um, because I think we can also observe then that in this regard, the European Union will not find or will hardly find to like to one opinion or to one approach. Yeah, because as um, we can remember what that Hungary has quite good relations to Azerbaijan and um, 
but not at all, not even political relations to Armenia. And on the other hand, Greece and uh, Cyprus already um, support and France also support Armenia. How, how do you see like any any chance to, to come to a common approach? Yeah, I think it would be a mistake for the European Union to come in favor of one or the other party in this conflict. I think what is the most important thing is, of course, we have these two elements. On the one hand, the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan, and on the other hand, the threat for the humanitarian catastrophe and expulsion of, uh, of Armenians from Karabakh if, should this become or uh, invaded by the Azerbaijani army. So, and I think that we're really talking about a very valid threat of expulsion as the recent policies of the Aliyev government have shown. So I would say that the European Union should really consider Karabakh independence. I Mechanisms, what bodies would um, need to be involved for the European Union to officially recognize the region of Nagorno-Karabakh as independent? And what can we really learn of Europe's mobilization, of Europe, Europe's action, if we see how Europe is acting in regards to Belarus? I think that, um, exactly. So we saw, as you said, in Belarus, that Europe really blacklisted several Belarusian politicians and businessmen uh, that, around, that are part of the Lukashenko uh, regime. And, Europe has been very active uh, in really recognizing the protests. Svetlana Tikhanovskaya was in Berlin and so on. Europe should stand for the self-determination of Karabakh people, for the right to live in their own houses. So, uh, dear Professor Theokaris, you are a professor at the Venerable University in Berlin. So, How do you see Germany's role, Germany's stance? Are there any mobilization of civic society, political society? How does the business community respond? Do you see activism or more or less a lack of activism? So the Armenian communities in major German university towns, Berlin is one of them, but also in South Germany, we have observed it, are very active. But I think that German public opinion is not really, uh, has, has not really become sensitivized um, to this topic, to the Berg Karabakh topic. Um, so, I mean, the trade off is presented in German media in a very simplistic way. So they say by international law standards, it's Azerbaijan, by ethnic composition, it's Armenian. And usually they say they don't really discuss the politics. Uh, the politics and um, the economic and the economic dimension of the conflict. And what about the scientific community within Berlin? Um, do you notice something that I think there have been like really a lot of discussions about what has been happening still in Belarus? Is there something similar compared uh, with the ongoing war? When it comes to South Caucasus, Berlin is quite strong in Georgian studies. Uh, much less than in Armenian or Azerbaijani studies, if one could say, could use those terms. I mean, uh, Berlin has a very serious expertise on Georgia, both in terms of policy analysis and in terms of cultural studies. Uh, but Arme the Armenia and Azerbaijan, I mean, the co and the conflict itself, I mean, there are only some experts in some policy institutes here in SVP and in Choice that they have been working on it, but uh, also not in its deep historical dimension. We at this European Institute, of course, place a major importance on this, and we are going to make it part of our, uh, I mean, discuss, discussing the conflict will be part also of our, uh, of our ring for lesson for this semester, for the coming winter semester. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, the interest is increasing, um, and we really hope to maintain the bridges. Okay, then I think what is important for us to understand, what can you do? What can other professors do? And who are the actors that can be mobilized in Germany? So I think it's quite important to avoid uh, st stereotypes, characterizations, demonizations of the other, 
yes, it's a war, and in the war there is always an enemy, but it doesn't always have to continue like this. And I think that universities should be spaces where the position of the other is should be better understood. And I think that this is my contribution to make people that are more Armenian friendly to understand the Azeri position and to make people that are more Azerbaijan friendly to understand the Armenian position. And that we need all of us to agree that the right to life and the right to live in your ancestral homeland should be respected. Very powerful words, a call to human rights, I could say. And um, as our interview nears its end, we can only say thank you for your insights. Thank You're you for, for your time, Professor Theokaris. And um, yes, let me know if either you or Ricardo, if you have any concluding remarks. Yeah, thank you very much. Also, um, Professor Theokaris, I am very uh, glad as uh, yeah, one of your former students uh, to, to uh, it was possible to have the interview um, with you. And um, also the last words, I think, especially universities all over the world where um, Armenians and um, um, Azerbaijani students um, um, learn together can be a room for, for interacting. <laughs> and um, so I, I really appreciate your, your last words concerning this. And I really hope that um, the, the Freie Universität um, will do or will support um, these um, steps because we can see, uh, like my impression from Armenia is, of course, now in this time of war, there is almost no room for intercommunication yeah. Yeah, because right now emotions are just... Yeah, above um, the head. They're completely ruining everything, everything yeah. else, of and course. Understandably. It's understandable. Yeah, so, um, and, but hopefully at some point we will come to to the times when when um, we will be able to to um, yeah use these rooms for common talks and understandings. I fully agree with you, uh, Ricardo, and I think that um, this is what this is what we can now uh, hope for. I believe that Europe will really cooperate with Russia in bringing an in, in uh, bringing this conflict to an end. And I do believe that um, because essentially the, why has this conflict become so uh, protracted and unproductive? Because no one wanted really to solve it. And everybody used this conflict as a frozen one to demonize the other, to justify its own, his own or her own dictatorship and uh, not explaining why they're not making essentially any serious steps forward. Now this must end. Karabakh should stop being an excuse for the dictatorship of Aliyev, for the economic isolation of Armenia and security dependence on Russia. It should stop. It should stop being instrumentalized by everybody at the expense of the people that live there. Because Karabakh Armenians are also much poorer than Yerevan Armenians, and this is also unfair. So I think that everybody is using that conflict for domestic reasons and Russia for its own strategy. So this region must find its own way to the world above and beyond those calculations. And I think this is something that Europe must do. With these words, we say thank you and conclude today's session with Professor Theokardis Rigoriades from the Freie Universität Berlin. Thank you very much.